Greg cannot. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are... Uh, you guys are fortunate to have the Holy Spirit as a teacher, amen? You could have gotten me. I, uh, I, ho I hope this doesn't come across wrong, but in, in a lot of ways, I, uh, I feel, um, man, there's just no good way to say this, but... Uh, Sometimes I feel sorry that you guys aren't in my shoes right now uh, because this is, uh, I get the privilege of having this therapy session every week. And I get the privilege of going through uh, my stuff that I see in the scriptures and that uh, the stuff that I'm sharing with you or the things that I uh, struggle with and I get to see my reflection and share that and I get to talk all that out and it's a, uh, you know, a huge advantage for me and, and, uh, and I recognize the, perhaps there's some brokenness in that system altogether that, uh, that I get that advantage in life of just being able to, to dig and to be able to uh, find my reflection in here to the point where I share it and sharing it is a another layer and level of accountability that is uh, so crucial into our into our journey here so i'm always thankful that that i have this opportunity and that really it is very therapeutic for me to to be up here and to share and to just go through my stories and uh i'm i'm really you know by nature a really private person and so um being able to share some of my stuff is really uh really helpful and powerful, but it is uh, not always the easiest thing to do, but it is the important thing to do. And so I'm certainly uh, grateful and uh, privileged to be here sharing with you today. We're going to read in John, uh, the Gospel of John chapter 6, and this is going to tell us the story. Uh, the, this is the account of the feeding of the 5,000. I got to tell you, this story is one of my favorites. I only have about 60,000. I'm sure that I sound like a broken record when I say well, this is one of my favorites, but this, here's what I like about this story. This one here, you know, like when you're, you're, you're putting, you're putting a, uh, something, you're putting a puzzle together and you get that piece that just helps you see a lot of other pieces. This is that piece for me. Uh, there, was, there was a big piece in here that really opened my eyes to some things about just kind of Jesus' methods and why Jesus does what he does and just kind of seeing a big picture uh, in this story. And so that's the uh, story we're going to get into today. I really love this one. Uh, before we, before we get into that, I just want you guys to think about how many of you guys here work? You have jobs, you have some kind of job, right? Okay. Or maybe you used to have a job. Yeah. Everybody. Okay. All right. So we, I think we caught everybody there. And what I really want you to do is I want you to get reflective here for a minute. And I, I want you to ask yourself, um, what are you working for? Why are you working that job? So I want you to think about that. Why are you working that job? Anybody willing to share? We'll take, uh, we'll take some answers if anybody's willing to share. Why are you working that job? <clears throat> um. Is it? Is the um, mic? Let me make sure I've got it green here. Yeah, there you go. All right. Um, so I work in the social work field, and right now I am doing in home care for um, developmentally disabled uh, adults. And um, when I applied for the job, I was <clears throat> expecting to be working with children. And so when I had the interview, and they were like, "Well, the position that we're hiring for right now is this." Um, I struggled a little bit with it because I was like, I don't know how this would be. And so I just took some time and I prayed about it. And I just know that no matter what, I'm going to grow here. I'm going to learn more patience for, you know, anybody. Um, and not to mention, like, I am doing things for people that many other people would never do. 
and um, helping people to try to better their own lives and grow themselves. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Who else? Uh, well, my answer is twofold, I guess. Uh, one, on the natural side of things, I mean, I have a family to provide for, but uh, like that song we sang, uh, the second one, uh, God gives me the very breath of my lungs, and I believe that he gives me, he's given me the job that I have, the opportunity. And uh, so on a spiritual side, uh, just from being there, I haven't even been there a year, but there's been a lot of opportunities and some I've taken advantage of, and I'll be honest, some of them I missed. But um, the building the relationships and producing fruit. Uh, and I just want to say, like, had you not even taken that job and got another one, like you said, no matter where you're at, you're going to produce fruit because that's what we do. Um, but uh, it's... It's for his glory. You know, we're his bond servants. We're bought with a price. That price was his blood. And so if he sends us somewhere, you know, we're his servant. We're, we're serving to glorify him. So wherever you're at, that's what you need to be doing. Um, and I, I struggle on the daily sometimes to really keep that in focus. But that is the, uh, the overall goal, I guess, to have yeah. that mindset. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Anybody else want to share why they're working. <laughs> I just work um, really as, a, as needed now, but I did home health for a very, very, very long time, and it's not something that I feel like I even chose because I've done a lot of different things since I started working many years ago. But uh, for me, it was I wanted to make a difference in people's lives, people that your average people don't really care about. They're like invisible to them. And that is why I, I didn't even really want to do this, but someone had suggested that I get into this field and I knew I had a gift to work with people. And my goal was just, Lord, I just want to make a difference here. You know, whatever you do, everybody's got different talents, but use the gifts, you know, that God has given you for his glory. Everybody can make a difference. Mm, beautiful. Beautiful. Fantastic. Uh, I, too, do home health, and um, I love helping people, so it's like I get paid to go visit my friends, and uh, many of them are very good friends of mine. Um, so I get to help them do all kinds of things, whether it's paperwork or, uh, you know, advice or, or, of course, nursing stuff, but, um, and witness when I get that opportunity. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Any, any, uh, <laughs> Cecil had a, so I, I noticed that on this question, we're volunteering other people. I'm seeing some volunteering other people, so... So, I mean, just talking in the career of your life, you know, I was a very disobedient uh, with my walk with Christ um, from a very young age. And it just amazed me now that I'm 50, I see where he took me so far. And um, I quit school. I'm not a college education person. And I'm just amazed every day that I go to my job. And I'm like, how did I get and then I just know it's God because I started off at Taco Bell and now I work for a major distributor to a very corporate level almost. And I'm just like, well, how did this happen? And it was definitely not by anything I did. Um, and then where I am with food, it's just, I don't get to talk to a lot of people about God at the work. Um, we're in our cubies. But it's amazing how... I'm surrounded by this, and they come to me and they say, here, take this to your church or take it to somebody that needs. So just in, in my silence, they know who God is through me. And I just like, go to work. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Any, anybody ever wanted to quit a job? So, the, so yeah, that's, I'm seeing some yes, right? Anybody ever wanted to quit a good job? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I'm seeing a ton of hands right now. 
people who've wanted to quit jobs and wanted to quit good jobs. Yeah, absolutely. So did you have somebody else had, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I thought about it earlier. Um, so what I do is like, I noticed that a lot of people in my, like do the same thing I do. Like they are enabling the people to be the way they are. Like we're supposed to help them to be able to do for themselves. Mm -hmm. So like in my, in my mind, I'm like, you know, teaching them to fish. Yeah. So like, that's one of the biggest things. And it's like so rewarding whenever you're teaching them this one thing over and over again. And then all, all of a sudden they're able to do it on their own. And yeah. I, I know that you relate to that. But, yeah, definitely. Uh, but like, that's, that's like one of the biggest things. Mm. Yeah, cool. All right, so we've, uh, is, who's ever quit a job? Anyone quit a job? All right, so that's, that's a lot, right? Look like most of us. My brother's not in here. He's, uh, he's, 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 uh, he's quit several jobs. Uh, we like to joke with him when he was uh, a younger guy. He worked at every place on Fifth Street in Eureka. He worked at just, you know, quit one, move down to the next one, you know. Um, and so I want us to just be thinking about, because jobs are a big part of our life. Rather, we want to admit that or not, that's what we spend most of our time doing. Uh, we spend, uh, you know, some, some spend 30 hours, some spend 40, and some spend more doing a job. And uh, it, it's a big part of our lives. And, and so I really want us to start thinking about why we're doing that, right? I think the, um, you know, we've gotten some, uh, some pretty good answers this morning, but there's probably some that are real obvious that if we ask that on the street, not in this house, but if we ask that in, in, on the street, what would most people say? Right, right? It's, it's yeah, man. <laughs> What did you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So it's. Um, I, I want us to. I want us to contemplate that um, because it's a big part of what we do, right? And and it's uh, work, and it's something we deal with every day. Well, most of us deal with it every day. And so uh, uh, I'm gonna, we're going to get into that a little bit as we go through this story. Uh, we're starting now in John chapter 6, verse 1. And after these things, Jesus went out to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And then a great multitude followed him. And because they saw signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And when Jesus went up to the mountain, there he sat with his disciples. And so the picture is here. We know that Jesus has gone about doing some miraculous things and he's healed some diseases and he is starting to get some fame. And there are some people now who are wanting to check this out and, and starting to follow him. And uh, verse four says, now the Passover, a feast of the Jews was near and Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? So this is big multitude of people on the way. And it's interesting is Passover. And I'm, I'm curious that maybe Jesus is wanting to have a Passover meal with these guys. And so uh, in order to have a Passover meal, we need bread. And so he, he is now asking his disciples, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. So when Jesus asks a question, and he does do that all the time, are we listening? And he asks the question, he says, what should we do to feed all these people? Where, what, what could we possibly do to, to feed all these people? Jesus isn't looking for suggestions, is he? Still, he's not looking for suggestions. Philip answered and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them. So immediately, Philip answers the question by saying, the money that we have is 200 denarii. That's not going to be enough money to buy bread for that multitude of people. And then one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, 
There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, make the people sit down. And now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in a number of about 5,000. Again, I'm going to refer back to how awesome it is to get this gospel from John, because John was a close encounter. He was there through all of these things. And so this is a firsthand account. And what I love about the gospel of John is that there's just so many rich details, like there was a lot of grass. It was a great place to sit down. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's just this thing that, that helps me like, wow, look how seriously uh, purposeful John was just in recalling this stuff. Like, yeah, I remember like it was yesterday. There was so many people, but there was this perfect place for everyone to sit down, all this grass. So Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples um, to those sitting down and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. And so when they were filled, he said to the disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Which is a weird thing for Jesus to say. Because that is typically not, uh, that is not the instructions that God would typically have. In fact, God gave different directions in the Old Testament. And he said, don't take up the fragments. Just eat what you need and leave it be. And now Jesus is telling his disciples, I want you to pick up the fragments um, from, I want you to pick up the leftovers of this. And therefore, verse 13, they gathered them up and they filled 12 baskets with the fragments of five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, truly, this is the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Here is this, here is this miraculous situation, and Jesus, is, he's, he's got this crowd coming, and he knows he wants to feed these people. And so he, he goes to his disciples and says, what should we do about this? There's these people. We want to have Passover. What should we do? And they got to think about that. Like, what should we do? And their answers aren't very good, are they? The first one is, well, we don't have enough money. Anybody ever had that as an answer before? <laughs> we don't have enough money to do that. And the second one said, well, we got, we got some fish and some bread, but I don't see how possibly that could equate to what you're wanting to do here. And so Jesus does this incredible miracle, and he says, I want you to have the people sit down. And then he just starts breaking the bread and handing out fish, and it just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming and coming, and, and, the, and there's 5,000 men. They feed thousands and thousands of people. And then for the first time, Jesus says, I want you to get baskets and gather up all the leftovers. And there just happens to be 12 baskets of leftovers. And these disciples, uh, and how many of you are excited about leftover fish? <laughs> I'm not excited about leftover fish with refrigerators. I can only imagine what it was like without refrigerators. And so Jesus has them gather up the leftover fish and the leftover bread and puts it into baskets. And now the people have eaten, things are done, they're moving on, and they're going to load these up into the boat. So I just want you to picture that. That you're picking this up and you're putting your face in that basket and you got the smell of fish. And you're like, wow, man. What, a, what an incredible reminder this is of this day that this miracle has taken place. So I got to ask Jesus, why would you then change up and never have people get leftovers? And now all of a sudden you're asking the disciples to get the leftovers. I, and, and this was the piece that put a lot of things together for me in the Bible. The story was not about the 5,000. 
the story is about the 12. This had nothing to do with the 5,000 people. Jesus wasn't trying to make a name for himself. He wasn't trying to gain fame. He wasn't trying to gain believers. This is hard for us. No, this is not what I was taught. This was about 12 men whom he was discipling. And most of the New Testament is about Jesus discipling those 12 men. And if you look at the story and you go through that and you miss that it's all about discipling, then you've missed most of the story. And if you go to church and you miss the discipling part, then you've missed most of the story. Because Jesus was discipling. And he, here's how he discipled. He would, create, he would present a situation, and then he would make the disciple get into the situation and say, what should we do? So the disciple could step into the situation safely and go, I don't know. And so this whole exercise and this whole thing, it wasn't about, you know, it was, Jesus wasn't doing it so he could just see this miraculous glory of God in the situation. Jesus did this because he wanted to teach 12 men how to follow him. And so what he did, here's what's interesting, is because after Jesus does this, what happens with the people? They freak out, flip their lid. They're like, ah, oh, this is the greatest thing in the world. This dude just fed 5,000 people with his bare hands. Just stuff was coming out of nowhere. This has got to be miraculous. This has to be from God. And so they're all like, this is it. Yeah. And they're having all these flashbacks of great Old Testament prophets and things how God would miraculously provide for them, would provide bread. And they're just like, oh, man, this is it. And they're all worked up in a frenzy to the point where they're like, this is the king. We're going to make him our king today. To where Jesus was like, uh, that's not what I wanted. See you later. And just disappears. Goes away. Because he wasn't interested in the multitude. He was interested in teaching the twelve. Because they had to ask themselves. I mean, think about it. They know they don't have anything except for these Five and two. And they really have to ask themselves, where in God's green earth is this coming from? How, how is this happening? Where is the magic fish coming from? Where are the magic loaves coming from? We started with like this much, and now we have this much apiece. And so they have this reminder smacking them in the face of lugging this stuff into the boat going, where, where did this come from? How did we get so much stuff? Where, where did this all come from? And it was a reminder because I, I can imagine, because the very first thing that Jesus did with his disciples was a miracle about what? Well, yeah, that was, that was when he did with the, with the mom, but the, when he first called them. Yeah, right? When he first called them, he brought them, he, he, he filled their nets to where it almost sank their boats. Just remember the, like the disciples are probably remembering the struggle of getting all those fish in and just what a task that was. And just, wow, just imagine picking up nets that had 153 fish in it or whatever it happened to be. And now they're experiencing that same thing with these fish and going, wow, how does he keep doing this? Like, we were impressed when he brought the fish out of the water, but how is he bringing them out of thin air? Where is this stuff coming from? And so the story is about him teaching them what was important and developing in them trust. Like the kind of trust that says, look, we ain't got it, but he's going to make it. We don't know how he does it. We just know we can trust him. You know what? We've seen him pull it out of the water. We've seen him pull it out of the air. He can make it. 
We don't know how he does it. We just know that he can do it. And we're trusting him. We're learning to trust in him. As they load those baskets, what they're realizing is we can trust him. Man, he, he is there. He's performing this. He is, he, he, when he asks the question, this is, this is what they have to now do. As disciples, they now have to ask the questions that he's asking. When he said, where are we going to get the fish? They now have to think about that. You know what? Where are we going to get the fish? What was the right answer? We're going to get it from Jesus. We're going to trust Jesus. Because ultimately, what does God want from us? Trust. Just trust. Right? So that's what he's building in us. And, and many of these stories are about us being on this journey and following him and about these 12 following him and learning to trust him in all situations. Jesus wasn't trying to become the king in that moment. He wasn't trying to win fame and popularity. He was simply trying to teach these guys a simple lesson about trust. And wow, what a lesson. Imagine that lesson. Man, how powerful would that be? In that same chapter, we'll skip down to verse 25. When they finally found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you that you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. So the multitudes finally catch up with them, and they're all in a frenzy, still wanting to find him. And he says, the reason why you're searching for me and, and you're, you're all excited right now is not because I can work miracles, but it's because I can fill your belly. And what you like about this is that you want something physical. And your expectation is for things that are physical. And the reason why you're excited about me, Jesus, is because you think that I can give you physical things. Wonder if there's still a belief system that believes that way. That's excited about Jesus because he can get them physical things. Because he can fill our bellies. Give us what we want. And in fact, Jesus was not teaching that lesson. He was teaching a different lesson. Because the disciples, when they were asked the question, what are we going to do about this? They immediately went to what resources? Physical, right? Money, the fish, anything physical. I can't, all of my answers are physical. And what Jesus was teaching was, None of your answers are physical. All of them are spiritual. And let me show you because I'll take things that are invisible and make them visible. Jesus taps into a spiritual existence and manifests it in, in the physical world. And he was showing his disciples, you see this? The real stuff is in the spiritual world, not the physical. And so the lesson he was teaching them was that stop physicalizing everything and stop trusting what you can see and start trusting in what you can't see. Start trusting in spiritual things. And he was opening their eyes to a whole new world. That was the 12. The multitude, they weren't seeing any of that. All they were seeing was the physical stuff. It says, bring me more, Jesus. Bring me more bread. Bring me more stuff. And his instructions and advice to them were this, verse 27. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set a seal on him. He says, don't work for food that perishes. Man, I wonder how much of my life I spent working. I mean, think about it. How much of our lives do we spend working to get a house, to get food, to get the things that we want? And Jesus' instructions are, don't work for those things. 
that stuff's all going to fade away. That stuff will all go bad. That stuff will all spoil like stinky fish in a basket. Don't work for that. Work for the spiritual. Work for the things that are eternal. And so, you know, when we think about our jobs and doing our jobs, I, I have to reevaluate all the time and say, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this job? Is it because I'm trying to pay the bills? While that sounds noble, and, and, and it's true that we, we do have to, to provide for our families, uh, there's, there's a, uh, that can't be the why I'm working there. Here's the, uh, you know, if I took a look at myself over the last 10 years, there are hundreds of moments that I can really ask myself the question, why are you working here? And it was so I could have a nice house, so I could have food, so that I wouldn't be inconvenienced by anything. So that I could have, uh, so I could have some property, so I could get a four wheeler, get a boat, jet ski. That's why I'm working. Those are my answers for why I'm working, and I get to acknowledge that those are all physical things, and that's not the stuff that we should be working for. And so Jesus finds us all in these moments where we're laboring for food that perishes. But his instructions are that we should labor for food that endures to life everlasting. And it's so, it's so it is that I had to change my perspective. And here's what God was simply saying in this gentle way. Like, I don't want you to, uh, Greg, I don't want you to, I don't want you to quit working. I just need you to change bosses. And I don't mean like that guy's not your boss, I am. What I mean, Greg, is that you're not the boss, I am. Because I was working for me. I could be working for a company, but it was all for me and my stuff. And God's saying, what I really want is to be the boss in your life. So that you're not the, no longer the boss of why you're working, but now you switch and you're working for me instead of for yourself. And quite honestly, as I began to do that, holy cow, things have changed for me. Like dramatically. Things have changed in incredible ways I can't even begin to describe, except many of you are benefits of that. Just how, how much of a game changer that was for me to switch bosses right in the middle of my career. And man, what an what a, what a awesome thing that was. Just to see how, hey, God, okay, you got me here. What am I doing? And he just opens all these doors to where we have an entire church in Wentzville full of people who work there who had questions about God. And God was like, I'm going to put you right in the middle of all of them so you can answer these questions. And, they start, and we started a home church together. Man. That would never happen if I didn't switch bosses. If I was working for myself. Man, what a powerful thing that was. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered to them and said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. Therefore he said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. What are they looking for? More, more bread. Physical stuff. They're hearkening back to the days of Moses and saying, well, our fathers got bread from heaven and we're so excited that you're here, Jesus, because are you going to then also give us bread from heaven? And Jesus' answer is, I really didn't come for that. He's like, what do, you, what do you mean get bread from heaven? Because I got news for you. You're looking at it. I am the bread from heaven. 
because they are trying to physicalize everything and he is spiritualizing everything. And so when Jesus talks, guess what he's talking about? Spiritual things. He's always talking about spiritual things. And how do we often hear it? Natural things, which is why a lot of our church doctrines get really jacked up because Jesus says spiritual things. We translate them into natural things and there's a huge disconnect there. And so Jesus is trying to give them spiritual things. And so what I love what Jesus does here is that he gets into this topic about bread coming down from heaven. He's like, oh, y'all want something to eat, huh? You want something to eat? Okay, all right. Tell you what, here's something that you can have to eat. Because I have what you need to eat. He says, my, my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed course, what is he talking about? What, what is he talking about there? How is his flesh going to be food for us? He died on the cross. He's saying what he's going to do. He's saying he's going to give up his life, his flesh, his literal flesh is going to be torn apart on our behalf for sin. And as we take that in, we are now receiving spiritual food and spiritual life. And so this is the thing that he's describing. He's describing something that is spiritual, but people can't understand it because all they want to hear are things that are physical. And so he just gets real, real detailed and graphic with this conversation, talking about drinking his blood and eating his body. And listen, this is hilarious because Jesus was not trying to... Um, he wasn't trying to win over the crowd, was he? Like we oftentimes think, if there's a crowd, we should try to win them over. And Jesus was not at all trying to win over a crowd. Instead, he was trying to teach those 12 about spiritual things, trumping anything that is a natural thing. The whole lesson was for those 12. And here's how we know it at the end. Because when it's all said and done, They all leave him. They're, they're murmuring about this. And all the other followers and people who came in, they're all murmuring about it. And Jesus is, is sensing it and he's understanding it. He's hearing all the murmuring and complaining about it. And ultimately, they all are going to turn from him. And I love this, this uh, in verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? Which is a great question, right? I mean, don't you love it when you hear a message and it ends with, does this offend you? <laughs> That's Jesus. He's asking the question, does this offend you? Which we should really ask ourselves. When I open this book and read it, does this offend you? Yeah, it does a lot of times. Why? Because I got a lot of insecurities and you're telling me the stuff that's going on in my life and I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. He says, what, a, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit. They are life. There are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. He said to them, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted to you by my father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Imagine that. Jesus intentionally gives this message to help the 12 see spiritual versus natural. And many of the people who were following him made a decision that they were no longer going to follow him anymore. They were so offended by his teaching and they couldn't understand it because they could only hear it through a natural lens that they were so offended that they stopped following Jesus altogether. These were disciples who had been following him and are now choosing, we are not going to follow him anymore. 
This is too much. We can't, we don't understand it. We can't take it in. This is too weird and we're out. But the guys who had held those baskets and put them into the boat, the guys who had been there handing out the food, looking in the basket going, how's he doing this? How's he, what? How's this happening? Those guys, he turns to those and says, are you guys leaving too? Because this is really the real question that he wanted to ask them. This whole thing was about getting to a point of asking them, are you guys going to leave too? To which Peter replies, I think it was Peter. I could be wrong. Where would we go? I mean, where would we go? I can't unsee what you did. I can't unsmell the fish that was in my face. Where would we go, Jesus? You have the words of eternal life. I don't get it. I don't understand them. They're not ringing clear with me right now, but I know they're the words of eternal life. And I know that the problem is not on your end, it's on my end. I'm following you. I don't get it. I don't understand all the blood and body talk, but, but I know that you're trying to do something here and I'm just not receiving it and understanding it, but we're with you. And then you would expect that after you give an answer like that, that Jesus would go, great job, and celebrate you, and you guys got it. Right? Because Jesus, that's what he would do in that situation. But that's not how John remembers it. John remembers that he looked at the 12 and he says, by the way, did I not call you 12 and one of you will betray me? Right? What's that all about? Jesus will say things and ask things because he is constantly, as a discipler, he is constantly trying to get us into a point of reflection and take an examination of what's going on in this heart. To where he can, he, he will have things, make things happen so that he can ask you the question, are you still going to follow me? So that you can dig down and go, what's real here? And then he can, so he could say things like, one of you will betray me so that people could start digging in their heart and go, would I do that? Would I betray him? Would that be me who did that? Because this really was about him discipling 12 people. And church is really about discipling people. And when we miss that, we miss the whole story. We miss the biggest part of that story. That Jesus was doing all this to invest in those 12 guys. Do you know why? Because he knew that he was going to leave. And that these 12 guys had to carry this on. And that those 12 guys would need to make disciples so that look where we are now. This was all because Jesus discipled 12 men and invested everything into these 12 men. Because he stayed with it and said, I want to see fruit come from these 12 guys. And so he did all of these things investing in these 12 people. I love that. I love that. Uh, I, I prepare for this conversation every week because I have to go real deep in here and dissect and deal with all the stuff that's going on and look at the ugliness that is me. And I get to reflect on that stuff and hear the truth and dig deep into that and do it in such a way that would be beneficial hopefully to you. And uh, I remember, I remember I was going to uh, Bible school where apparently they want to teach you how to do a job or something. And I remember them saying that as a, as a pastor, you should not, uh, you should not prepare. You should do two separate preparations. You should do one, one preparation for you and then one preparation for the congregation. You should read for your own stuff and then prepare something separate for your congregation. And so far, for five years, I've not done that one time. 
which they would shame me for. Luckily, I'm not a pastor. I'm a disciple. And as part of a disciple, we disciple other people. It just happens so stinking rarely that we decide to call people pastors. But really, it's the call of every disciple to make more disciples. It's in the definition. It's in the ingredients. It's hardwired. It's part of the whole thing is that you would learn this. And the whole journey for Jesus was about the 12. So that the 12's journey could be about 12 other guys. So that their whole journey could be about 12 other guys. So that their whole journey could be about, so that, so that one day somebody would come along and say, you know what, I'm going to invest in this guy they call Saul. And then Saul becomes Paul. And Paul decides, I'm going to invest in Timothy and Titus and all of the others that you see throughout the New Testament and these scriptures that we have that, that laid the groundwork for what we're doing. These were the apostles doing this, but at the, at the core and at the heart of it, they were disciples, simply making more disciples, which is what our job is, to make more disciples. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you that your word does not return void, but it accomplishes what you sent it to do, which means that you just looked at this day and you knew those of us who would be here, and you pointed these words like an arrow and landed them at this target. It was your specific target, and you must have had a purpose. And if you had a purpose, we trust that it will be fulfilled in us. God, we thank you for your scripture that is full of life and full of truth, but that you give us a Holy Spirit that allows us to see the truth that we had otherwise been blind to. God, I thank you for the investment that you made in your followers. I thank you for the investment that you continue to make in us. And God, I pray that we would all have ears to hear and hearts to respond to your word. God, we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I love about Jesus. He saw the... He saw the beginning from the end. He could see things that were coming. There's another conversation. Jesus would often say that his time had not yet come. And we now know what Jesus was referring to when he says, my time is not yet He'd say, I can't do this or that because my time is not yet. He would tell certain people, you're not going to be able to get me because my time is not yet. But do you know there was a time coming for Jesus? And that time that he was talking about was what would happen at the cross, the crucifixion. And so, this morning as we enter this time of communion, the Lord's Supper, the Passover meal that he had with his followers. We want to be clear that we have no rules at this except that you recognize what this is and that you understand that this is representative of his body. And just as he spoke about spiritual things, these right here that we're taking are physical things that we understand are spiritual things. And so they're reminders for us, much in the way that carrying those baskets were reminders to the apostles of how real Jesus was. And this is a reminder for us of how real Jesus was and is. See, Jesus knew this day was coming for a long time. And he had the dread of knowing how things would end for him. He had the dread of knowing what was coming. A lot of times for us in our natural world, the punishments we dread most are the ones that are still a little ways off. And we have the, the dread of knowing what's coming. And so just the, in the pit of your stomach, knowing what's coming. 
And Jesus was very aware. And Jesus, in a moment of reflection and prayer, he said, I've been and knowing this day was coming, and now it's here. And I don't want to do it. Because it is dreadful. And I can't, I can't stand the things that are about to happen. I can't stand that my family is going to stand by and have to watch their son be crucified and made fun of and taunted. I mean, just, I can only, like, even with my child, when someone makes fun of my child, I know how bad that hurts. So imagine parents, the mom standing there seeing these things happen, his disciples. He knows the full dread of the things that are about to take place. And he says, God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But he has this revelation. It's still not my will. Let yours be done. And what Jesus was saying is, you're the boss. And I don't, I don't want to go through this. But I didn't come here for me. I came here for you. And he made that decision. And wow, look how it's impacted our lives. This morning, we take this bread in remembrance and we recognize that as we partake of this bread, we are identifying that this body was broken in our behalf and that Jesus paid a price for us. And we now identify with him and with the work that he did for us on the cross. That same night, he took a cup and he passed it to his disciples and he said, this is the, this cup. And I poured in front of you is the wine, and it is symbolic of the new covenant of my blood that's going to be shed on your behalf. I imagine at this moment, the disciples are now having an aha moment. And they're starting to understand what Jesus was talking about with the bread, with the body and the blood. And they're having this aha moment, and they recognize what Jesus is saying to them. And he says, this, this is the blood of a new covenant. And man, it gives me great confidence to partake in this. Because I know that when God looks down on me and sees me covered in the blood of Jesus, I can't be more proud. There aren't any accomplishments. There aren't any tasks. There aren't any feats. There aren't any good works that I can do that make him more pleased than when I put my trust in him and, and I put my complete, absolute trust in his blood that covers all of my sins. And I am 100% clean and righteous because of the blood of Jesus. And as this moment, as I partake of this, he looks down with great pride and says, that's my boy. Because when he looks down, he sees Jesus covering all of us. Father in heaven, we thank you for our time together this morning. We thank you for the price that you paid. And we thank you that you went to great lengths and that you made a decision to not follow your own will, but to follow the will of the Father. And we reap the benefits and that you purchase us, that we were bought and paid for, the price was paid in full, and that all of my sins are washed away. God, I thank you for what an incredible deal that was. And I thank you that you didn't just leave us at the cross, but you came back and conquered death and you give us new life and you give us the power of your resurrection to sustain us and, and, to, uh, and to propel us forward through this life. God, we do thank you for that this morning and we cherish our time together. And I cherish this group that you are 
planting us in. And God, we thank you so much for everything that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to thank you guys for being here this morning. I also want to uh, make sure that you know we've got lunch to anybody who wants. Everyone's welcome. Uh, we have lunch together uh, every week, so there's plenty of food, so stick around for that if you'd like. One reminder, uh, this Saturday, the 21st, we are, uh, we're starting a clothing ministry where we'll be handing out clothes, and so that is from 10 to 1. Is that right? Yeah, it's 10 to 1. So 10 to 1. So uh, we'll be handing out uh, clothes or helping out in any way. Um, we'll need people there praying. Uh, people have prayer requests and things of that nature. And so um, wear your following shirts so that uh, people can identify you. And uh, if you're feeling nervous about this stuff, then you're on the right track. Right? That's what Jesus wants you to do is be nervous about stuff. Go to places you haven't been. If you don't go to places you haven't been, you're probably not following Jesus. All right, so we need some workers Tuesday at 1 to help separate clothes. We keep getting clothes in uh, all the time, so we're, we'll need some help Tuesday at 1 to uh, help sort those out as well. If you can't make Saturday, uh, help us out on Tuesday. All right. All right, normally we, uh, oh, okay, so uh, Uncle Ernie, I don't see him, but Alan, if you could say a blessing over the meal. Amen. Have a good week.